Super. All right, so thanks everybody uh, for joining us today. Um, we've got a couple of different folks. I'm just, my name is Tyson Fiora from Biggs. I'm here to do more of the moderating and let the two experts, Mark Manti from the Vancouver Clinic and David Underwood from Sun Life Financial um, to, to lead most of the conversation. We're gonna have a couple polls in there. So if you haven't done that before, it'll be real easy. It'll pop up on your screen and um, give you some multiple choice answers. We're really just trying to, um, get a little bit more information for the conversation. Um, it might help uh, while you're providing the information. And so today's topic is talking a little bit about everybody's favorite word and, and probably that new image that you know, burned in our mind with that little red look. Uh, but talking about how it's affecting healthcare utilization and um, insurance renewals as well. Um, Mark's gonna help us understand a little bit how his clinic, uh, the Vancouver Clinic's been impacted. And then David's gonna talk about the um, you know, the, the big stuff, the big claims, and, and how that's going to really get around to your uh, your insurance side of things. Um, so again, um, we've got Mark Manti from the CEO of Vancouver Clinic. We'll have him do a quick little intro as he gets started and in, in, in chatting there. Um, if you do have questions while he's talking or David, again, use the chat log if you can. Um, we'll do a little bit more background, um, and Mark's mainly going to be talking um, in this little bullet here calling proper patient utilization. Um, and then we've got uh, David jumping in when it gets to utilization costs and the impact on insurance. And then we'll just close up uh, from there. So um, as I mentioned, we're going to do some polls, um, which I know you're really excited about. This one actually is going to be kind of a two-parter um, and you can do multiple choices. So hold on a second while I get that um, going here. And I'm going to launch it right now. So it should show up on your screen. Um, and if you can, um, just go ahead and, and answer the question one and two. And the difference is there is it's really focusing on telehealth or telemedicine and utilization from your company. So how um, was it offered um, in January or before January? And then also how was it offered um, March and after? So if you can, uh, go ahead and click on, on those, those answers for us. Super, those are starting to come around. So thanks for, uh, for doing that. Glad you found the, your mouse in front of you. I'll we'll just give it just about 10 to 15 seconds longer here. Cool. So I'm going to end the poll um, now. So thanks again for um, giving us the answer. So Mark, just to give you just a heads up there that the, basically the answers um, that came in is uh, pre-COVID, if we'll just kind of define it that way, is the January before. Uh, mainly it was being offered, uh, but very few were using it. And there was a couple um, that actually were trying it new for the first time. Um, and then, you know, COVID and after, um, again, obviously it was being offered. Um, but much less on the answers of it was very, uh, very few were using it and it switched completely from to being a key resource for a lot of companies as well, where it wasn't mentioned that way in, in the uh, January time. So um, I'm going to go ahead and click back over here. So if you can, Mark, do a quick introduction for yourself um, and also um, for the company. All right. Good morning, everybody. Um... So my name is Mark Manti and I serve as CEO for Vancouver Clinic. Um, some of you may know us, uh, but for those of you who don't, um, we're a 380 clinician multi-specialty group. And um, actually we're the largest independent uh, medical group uh, west of the Mississippi and north of California. So we serve about um, 200,000 uh, patients here in Southwest Washington. Uh, we have eight locations and we're growing. We're going to open our Camas location um, in October and we opened Ridgefield last year. So we're growing with the community. Um, our philosophy of care, I'm going to get into that in a little bit, but we've made a significant investment in, in delivering on population health. And what I mean by that is that we're trying to look at all our patients together and saying, you know, we can design interventions um, that really make a lot of sense uh, at the employer level, at the insurer level or whatever. Um, and right now um, we apply that mainly against our, our Medicare Advantage population. We have, I think up 
to 15,000 lives in that right now. And we take care of a lot of older folks. And as everybody knows, older folks have more health problems. So um, we've performed really well with that. Um, we design programs like early intervention for diabetes, um, making sure that we close care gaps in um, using our electric, electronic health record to identify those. Um, patients get a lot of TLC uh, through the clinic, through our population health program. And that makes a big difference because we lower uh, admissions to hospitals and visits to ER, which is a pretty uh, expensive uh, proposition. Um, we have a new service that we started offering last year, and it's a neighborhood clinic concept. Again, this is for the Medicare Advantage population, but could easily be applied against a commercial population too. And I basically describe it as um, a clinic, uh, medical clinic focused on primary care, and um, but really addresses people's needs beyond medical care. So there's a social worker there. Uh, we have exercise classes when those are permitted, um, diabetes management classes, et cetera. And it's uh, it's sort of the cheers of healthcare where everybody knows your name. And the panel sizes for the doctors are um, are smaller, and we get to to know everybody. Next slide. Here we go. All right. Um, so we um, we pride ourselves in a all encompassing um, integrated model. Like I said, we we don't own a hospital uh, or an insurance plan. Um, we are really concentrating on. Um, you know, where people touch healthcare system the most, which is through their physician. So here's our patient in the middle, um, and we surround her with uh, primary care and specialty care. We have over 40 different specialties. So if um, she needs um, help with uh, orthopedics or vascular problems, uh, cardiology, we have those specialists all under one roof. Um, we admit to both Legacy and Peace Health Southwest and uh, have a good relationship with those folks. Um, we embed um, our physicians in the hospital. And when a patient is identified as having a high um, risk of readmission to the hospital, they actually go through something we call our transitions of care clinic where they um, are, are met with the same person that took care of them in the hospital. And we make sure that the family and the patient have everything they need so that hopefully they don't have to go back to the hospital. Um, we provide all kinds of ancillary services. So um, lab, imaging, um, ambulatory surgery. Um, we tie it all together with one medical record. So it's uh, uh, our EPIC system. Our patients are most overwhelming percentage of our patients are enrolled in the patient portal uh, called MyChart. And most recently, we've reached out with a lot more um, video uh, visits and digital health. So you can, um, if you're a patient with us, you can perform a lot of things in terms of uh, using that patient portal, scheduling your appointments, uh, scheduling your video visit. Um, you really don't even have to pick up the phone for a lot of things. And then I described population health uh, a little earlier, but think of it as, um, you know, we're really trying to enter into arrangements where we're incentivized and paid for keeping people healthy. And so that means we're going to invest in um, programs like uh, for, for CHF or um, diabetes, some of the chronic illnesses that can be pretty debilitating and costly if they're not handled right, right from the beginning. So that's a big emphasis of ours. Next slide. So how did um, COVID kind of rock our world um, and our patients? And um, we, um, I'm really proud that we have at this point um, actually treated close to 600 positive COVID patients uh, very safely. And uh, we have not had any patient to staff transmission. And um, that's because we've invested in in testing in a big way. And we formed some special clinics during the height of the pandemic 
um, that that handled uh, patients in a very safe way, and that continues to this day. So if you come into our clinic, you're going to be screened for temperature and um, asked to wear a mask. Um, everybody that cares for you will wear a face shield and a mask, and everything is handled uh, very well. And we're we have enough PPE that we're able to do that well and enough testing. So even if you uh, have surgery at our surgery center, um, we're gonna COVID test you prior to that um, so that you know we keep the risk of transmission really low. Um, this number um, of the number of people that we've tested is actually up to 26,000 now. Uh, and we've done over two thirds of the testing in Clark County. Um, we, uh, we were very fortunate. We had early access to some rapid testing through Abbott um, because we used their equipment for flu testing. And that really enabled us to um, get a good handle on the incidence and prevalence of this, um, um, of COVID in our community. We also assisted the public health department in community testing of um, a lot of hotspots and those were assisted living facilities and skilled nursing facilities in particular. Very vulnerable population, a lot of them are patients. And if you remember in Seattle, that's where um, an overwhelming proportion of the deaths occurred uh, because the pandemic really took hold on, on places like that. We stood up um, telehealth services in about three days. Um, so uh, that was quite an accomplishment. And uh, I'll show you some stats on, on how many of our visits now are through telehealth. Um, we were hit as a business. We're, we're a, a for-profit, privately owned company like a lot of you. And uh, our revenue dropped 75% in um, the months of March and April and May. So, um, but since then we've been recovering quite well. And, um, I'll show you some activity levels that uh, they give a will give you a feel for how much people are using healthcare right now. Um, there's been a strong resurgence of people getting back to, into the healthcare system. Next slide. So this uh, we keep track of this. It's a, a graph of our visit volume per week uh, since the beginning of the year. So you can see that we were in the 14 to 15,000 visit range. Um, you know, we did some phone visits prior to, uh, to March uh, and then um, very few video visits. Um, so then things kind of hit. We had the, the shutdown and you can see the significant dip there in the middle of the graph. Um, the proportion of visits that took off by video uh, was pretty impressive. So I think at, at the highest point in time, uh, over 25% of our visits were video. Um, that has uh, continued but abated somewhat. You can see that, you know, there's a steady climb out and we're actually now at a rate where we're exceeding previous uh, volumes for the year. So July was one of our strongest months ever in the clinic in terms of patient volumes. The last two um, are looking ahead. Um, so um, these aren't the, the finishing numbers for those weeks. So it doesn't, you know, don't get the impression that it's, it's dropping off. Usually uh, we produce this graph on a Monday and, and there's those last two uh, bars would show, um, don't show a full week of activity. So um, they have remained steady well above 14,000 uh, visits a week and, and running about 10% uh, video. Next slide. So um, some insights that, that uh, I think would apply to employers and, um, and your offering of health insurance. Uh, first of all, I think telehealth is definitely here to stay. Um, and I think we can deliver a lot of services that people were skeptical about, and we've learned to do that well. Um, so even a cardiologist can do a lot with a patient uh, with a video visit. And um, yeah, there's times where we'll need to get them in to actually listen to their heart, um, but it's, uh, it's pretty impressive uh, what can be done in a video visit. Um, 
I would make the point that there's going to be a lot of people offering you telehealth um, and be careful with that because I think, you know, um, there's a high chance of, of care getting fragmented and, and that's not going to be the best care for patients. So, you know, when you um, align with providers that, that uh, offer in office visits and urgent care and, and telehealth all as one package, and one medical record, I think the patients are gonna get the best care. So, so we're really careful to integrate this into a comprehensive model so that we know our patients. Um, don't expect uh, COVID-19 to go away with a magic swoop. Um, we are far away, I think, from a vaccination. Um, and the fall flu season will, will, will generate a lot of caution. I mean, if you show up at our clinics um, with flu-like symptoms, we're gonna treat you as a potential COVID patient. So um, all the, um, the testing uh, for both flu and COVID will be done at one time because it's really gonna be hard to differentiate the two. Um, I think there will be a vaccine. I think there'll be a variety of vaccines. Uh, we monitor this very carefully, but I can tell you that, um, you know, there's, there's no announcement. Um, we're not uh, in the supply chain yet and how you vaccinate millions and millions of people will be quite an effort and it will be um, triage. So chances are that essential workers and healthcare We'll get the vaccine first before the general population. Um, we're worried about the economic fallout of COVID. Um, you know, there's, uh, I would anticipate that a number of folks um, are going to transition to Medicaid. And um, I can't tell you that that is a real strong system uh, right now. So that's a concern. And uh, I know many of you offered health benefits to folks that you had to furlough. Um, I think that's a, a very noble thing to do. And my hat's off to you. We did the same thing when we had to furlough people. Um, so hopefully people will, you know, keep up with their, their prevention and uh, not go uninsured. But that's a real concern. And then, um, you know, I've been around for a while. I uh, have think have gone through two recessions at least, um, but it's always the case that um, you should expect sort of a, a utilization pickup during a recession um, because while people have benefits, they're gonna use their healthcare. Now let's work together to make sure they use it smartly. Um, really investing in prevention uh, management of chronic illness, et cetera. So, um, you know, we're, we're uh, real proud that um, we've been able to uh, continue service to the community. I think there's been some fallout um, from this in the healthcare provider community. Um, some people are consolidating or going out of business, unfortunately, uh, but I can assure you that Vancouver Clinic's uh, here to stay and and um, wants to do a good job for all of you. All right, I think that was my last slide. Yeah, that was great. So um, if you guys have questions, we're gonna kind of turn this into a QA and a opportunity uh, for the things that Mark shared. There was a couple things that came along um, while, you're, while you were speaking. I just wanted to uh, bring those up and, and give other people a chance to, to write in here too. So I'll just read from this real quick. Um, so, from the utilization that you guys are seeing, are you seeing anything in specific or specifically that people are avoiding? Like for example, labs, even though your utilizations come back and it's stronger, maybe from some of the backlog before, are there things that, that maybe people aren't doing? Um, mm. Well, I think um, in general, no. Um, we're seeing real good compliance from folks. Um, I, th I think we have seen a decrease in our urgent care utilization, mm -hmm. but that's probably just a result of the social distancing and people not being as active. Um, I do worry, we've seen a huge uptick in mental health. Um, 
And, you know, whether we're able to really handle the true volume out there is, is um, I, I couldn't tell you. Yeah. Um, it's been all hands on deck. Um, but I think that's a huge um, issue that we're seeing throughout the country. And uh, there may be a fair amount of untreated uh, depression and, um, and other things that are resulting from what we're going through. Do you, um, so I love the, the comment you made about the integrated model. I think that that's um, really critical and, it, and it, it's tough when you have a primary care provider that doesn't have the telehealth benefits um, that they can extend to their, um, whoever their patients are. Uh, we see this a lot where, you know, they may have kind of third party and this may be why people had um, used it, but it wasn't high utilization, that they don't know who the patient is when they're calling in. Um, what do you think besides like, obviously, you know, major emergency, um, what, what do you think are not good visits for video and, um, and for phone? Because I mean, they're clearly, you guys are still doing a lot of inpatient uh, visits. Well, right. Anything that, you know, really involves a, a procedure. Um, but, you know, I was, I was talking with uh, somebody um, it, with another group practice that specializes on caring for the elder in a very, you know, frail elderly population. And they're, they're doing, they're continuing to do 60% of their visits via telehealth. Wow. Um, so I, I think we as a profession have underestimated the, the value of telehealth. I think it, you know, it was never reimbursed uh, properly uh, until the pandemic. And um, that's just changed a lot of mindset. Um, yeah. So, you know, uh, you know, there's gonna be some, I, frankly, you know, if I'm, if I'm gonna have a major surgery, I wanna meet that surgeon in person. Um, I think that's a smart thing. Right. Um, you know, so, you know, that, that'd be an area, Tyson, that I, I would encourage people to, you know, mask up and, and come into the clinic. Um, mm -hmm. but there's so much else that can be done virtually. It's, it's impressive. Yeah. Yeah. And it seems like, I mean, you know, with all the change, obviously there's opportunities that come out of it. And there was already a lot of things that were starting to pop up, like I saw something called like a med wand or something where they can, you know, hold it and it has a whole bunch of different probes and things that you can do that can be communicated to the, I mean, I, I'm sure there's different things that will pop up with that, like that over yeah. the of time pretty quickly as this grows. We were seeing mergers. I mean, there was a $18 billion merger with Lavongo and, and Teladoc the other day. Um, and, and they're trying to merge their services together and, and see what mm -hmm. so it, there, there's still a lot of change that will come and a lot of opportunities, but it's great that you guys are, um, jumping on that yeah i think i think te telehealth should be viewed as an extension of the relationship not a substitute okay that I, maybe that's a good way to characterize it i like that yeah i wonder if generationally how that is seen too as well well i'll tell you i think um everybody assumes that you know the the younger population is going to adopt it more but um that's not necessarily what we've seen right um, <clears throat> and, and frankly, you can't assume that a younger person, um, you know, is, is going to just have a better experience and it's more appropriate for them. Because I can tell you plenty of cases where, where younger people um, have have needed to, you know, have that touch and um, in person relationship, you know, with a physician. So. Yeah. Well, and, and you mentioned the mental health side of it too. Um, that has been, an, I mean, access is an issue throughout the country. Um, on that piece and, and um, you know, having that, that consistent relationship with a therapist and, and things to be able to get up in front of, because I think you're hundred percent right. I think it's, it's majorly under, um, it's, it's an underserved market, but we really have no idea how, how far reaching it's going to be. And the impacts are going to probably come through um, pretty quickly to know, to know exactly what's going on there. Right. So, Mark, I appreciate you sharing. Um, now you can uh, ask a lot of questions of David here, here in a little bit. So that'll be, that'll be great. Well, I actually had a question of Mark before. Oh, yeah, go ahead. If at all Why possible. <clears throat> so uh, I saw on your slide that obviously you've seen an uptick in more procedures over the last month or so. <clears throat> yes. 
Uh, with those procedures coming through, have you seen any complications because they were put off or any increase in the cost of care? Yes, um, we have. Um, there were, there have been definitely, and it, this is more anecdotal, David, uh, than anything, but I've definitely heard of, you know, some people that have delayed care and it's, and it's resulted in their, you know, a, a, a less of a positive <laughs> prognosis. Uh, that's probably the best way to say it. Um, so, you know, we, we've been very concerned about that. And um, we've, we worked with public health and the two hospitals uh, to try and get the message out that, you know, you, if you're having chest pain, <laughs> you really should get in. <laughs> um, and if you're, you know, um, bloody stool or whatever, you know, all the signs of, um, of cancer, um, you should not put that off. And uh, unfortunately, during that couple months of um, stay at home, we did definitely see some, some cases that um, won't result in the most positive outcome, unfortunately. That's, you know, essentially what I, uh thought you would say and it's not not surprising to hear that it is unfortunate that it's a product of everything going on so everybody yeah. that's on the call make sure you're taking care of yourself as best you can and don't ignore that kind of stuff because it, yeah. it does have an impact yeah thanks for asking that was good all right so we're going to try our second and last poll so i promise we're not going to pull you to death um but this one is is kind of a fun one it's interesting and it definitely ties into um, what David is uh, going to be speaking on here in a, in a sec, but it's just the question is, um, what do you expect your medical insurance renewal to be um, this coming year? Um, and there's a couple little silly answers uh, probably on the, on the side of it, but, you know, just focus on the percentages. And if you can, um, go ahead and throw in your numbers um, there. That's great. Yeah, we're getting... Lots of votes. No one's expecting zero, so that's probably, I guess, a good thing as far as expectation, but it sure would be nice if that would happen. <laughs> More times than not. Okay. And it looks like, yeah, we're kind of in a tie here. Um, I'm going to end the poll here in about five seconds or so. Uh, but it looks like we're pretty much in a tie here on one to 5% um, with the kind of the comment to the side of that, the medical costs still have risen. But there's less to pay this. There was less to pay this last year, or um, pretty much um, what it's been in the past, and that's six to nine percent range. So um, that's uh, what we're getting there so far, uh, David. So I'm going to go ahead and switch to your first slide um, and go for it. Yeah. So first and foremost, David Underwood, uh, senior stop loss specialist at Sun Life Financial. Uh, Sun Life is the largest independent provider of stop loss insurance in the country. So what that means is uh, we're not tied to a network when I say independent. Uh, so, you know, we have a lot of our own studies and a lot of our own data that we're able to, to put to work for you guys um, that encompasses the entire country and not kind of specific to any sort of uh, individual region. But uh, for purposes of the conversation today, I'm going to kind of be more so focusing on the Pacific Northwest because obviously that's where I'm at and where I'm seeing, uh, you know, some of the claimed trends that are going on and everything uh, of that nature. So Tyson asked me to kind of speak with you guys all in regards to the, the impact of everything from a stop loss perspective. Uh, but before I take that uh, dive, I just wanted to make sure to cover what stop loss is, what spec and aggregate are at a very high level, um, because I'm going to be referencing these kind of things throughout the conversation. So. In this first slide, you see, you know, spec and aggregate integration. Uh, so what specific stop losses is, um, it's specific to one individual on the plan. Um, and in this example, you see the specific stop loss deductible level is 75,000. So what that means is that the employer is responsible for all the claims on that individual up to $75,000 uh, before the stop loss coverage kicks in. So that would be the dotted line in this uh, image here. And the, the dark blue amounts that are above that line is where the stop loss would kick in. And then everything below that is where the employer is responsible for that. Um, 
anything that's above that dotted line doesn't count towards the aggregate coverage, uh, which is important to note because that you know removes the volatility on that side of the plan uh, because of that spec deductible level and us paying out those claims, we don't accrue that towards uh, the aggregate level. So on this next slide, um, I'll take a little bit deeper dive into what aggregate is. And uh, so you see here, um, what we do on the aggregate side is we, we look at about a three year snapshot of claims uh, year over year. And like I said before, we take all those claims out that are above the spec. So it really removes that volatility and aggregate claims are pretty predictable because we're looking at a, a three year snapshot. Now in this example, uh, we look at that three-year snapshot and we come up with the number of $800,000 for your expected claims for the year. And then what aggregate coverage is, is that, that uh, amount that's above the corridor level. So you, you have to have uh, a corridor level. Um, you have to have aggregate coverage in the state of Washington. The lowest amount that you can have that corridor be is 20% but the typical amount that we see is 25. And that applies for Oregon as well. Um, but you have, so you have that margin in your plan, right? So in this example, the expected claims are 800,000 and then that margin before the stop loss kicks in or that corridor is 200,000, which creates an aggregate attachment point of a million dollars, right? So the, the stop loss uh, does not kick in and start paying claims until the aggregate claims below the specific deductible accrue to an amount that's above a million dollars. Uh, so in this example, the actual claims came through at $1.2 million. The employer responsibility was a million dollars and the stop loss responsibility was $200,000. So I know that was a lot really quickly, but uh, the reason I wanted to cover that is because, you know, with regards to COVID and those type of claims, it really does um, play a role so you know, on specific uh, stop loss uh, level, that's you know for the really large dollar claims. You know, majority of the high cost COVID claims that we're seeing have been under a hundred thousand um, dollars, and the majority of specific stop loss deductibles that we see on our plans are over a hundred thousand dollars as well. Right, so we're not going to see a ton of claims come through on the spec. Uh, also, just because uh, you know by nature of employer paid plans. Uh, people over the age of 65 who are you know, the ones that are typically having the higher COVID claims, they're not on employer paid plans because they're typically on, on Medicare, right? So that's, that's another factor that we don't really have to be too concerned about from a stop loss perspective. So you know, while there will be some uh, increase in claims from, from COVID related stuff, uh, we're also going to be seeing um, a decrease in elective claims like uh, Mark showed in one of his slides that you know, is more than making up for the increase in, in COVID claims. So not something that we really expect to see with regards to COVID alone having a big impact in, in your renewals. Um, then on the aggregate side, it's also an area where we feel confident that there won't be you know, an increase in, in stop loss claims, at least in, in the immediate. You know, once again, you know, the decrease in a elective non-emergency claims um, seem to be more than making up for the increase in COVID related claims. And then there's that whole margin component that's in your aggregate uh, coverage that really just allows for fluctuation in claims in general. Uh, on a year over year, basis, uh, Sun Life, uh, we only see aggregate claims on, on less than 2% of our employer groups. So it's pretty rare that you're going to see aggregate claims. And then even when you do, they're typically small dollar amounts, right? So we're not expecting uh, from you know, our block of business perspective to get really hit hard um, from COVID related claims on either the spec or the aggregate. So kind of right now, you know, a lot of employers have benefited uh, uh, that have been on self-funded plans just because they, they weren't having to pay that full, fully insured premium amount while the claims were dipping. You know, you're only responsible for the claims that are incurred and paid, um, and you're not responsible for a really high dollar premium, which is you know, one of the benefits of being on a, a self-funded plan in general. So, 
since March, we did see, you know, a significant drop in claims, uh, pretty much what Mark had showed in his slide as well. Um, so it's on par with what we're seeing. And um, we, we haven't really seen a big influx in claims yet. Um, so that'll be interesting to pay attention to as we uh, you know, go in, into these next few months into the year and, and in this next year. You know, one thing that uh, Tyson wanted me to cover was, you know, what's the impact of you know, claims that have prior authorization that uh, haven't had the surgery or, you know, things of that nature yet um, and what that impact has on our renewal. So this is where things get a, a little tricky uh, because of the nature of the pandemic and the uncertainty surrounding when claims will return to normal levels uh, and if they even will completely return. Um, also depends on the nature of the prior authorization and what the claim's for. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier, the net effect has been a, a decrease in claims, and uh, I've seen that over the last five months, but high dollar claims are still coming through, uh, through the plan, like such as transplants, uh, you know, high prescription claims, chemotherapy, things of that nature, because uh, those need to be happening and they're not elective, right? Where we aren't seeing the usual claims would be, um, you know, in the elective procedures such as knee replacements, uh, MRI, and, and other scans. So, predicting when those come back and how we apply them to your renewal is uh, is more so a product of when people start going back to the hospital for these procedures, which is uh, a little bit difficult to predict, right? You know, social distancing policies have been relaxed and we've seen some claims come back, but we haven't seen a huge uptick in claims from our perspective yet. Um, so it just goes to show that there's varying levels of comfortability in getting back to, you know, hospitals and, and places like that. Um, so in this next slide that I show you, you know, there's been multiple studies that have uh, been surrounding the decrease in claims uh, with regards to you know, the length of social distancing and, and when we start to see those claims come back and, and at what percentage do we start to see those claims come back. So in this graph, uh, this was put together by the Society of Actuaries, uh, which predicts how much claims decrease and when the claims start coming back and at what percentage. Um, so, so far this data is held true and I think it would, you know, it meshes with what Mark showed in his slide as well. So. What you see here, 100% would be the baseline without any sort of COVID claims um, or COVID impact. So the normal level of claims that we would typically see year to year. Uh, anything below that would be a decrease in claims as a percentage of that baseline. And then anything above that would be an increase. Um, so each month of the strict social distancing, the anticipation is that uh, we'll see a roughly 40% drop in claim spend for that month. Um, and I've seen that to be true so far. And then once social distancing is removed, uh, claims will come back and the anticipation is that, you know, in the first month or two of the return to no distancing claims would increase to roughly 20% over the baseline um, at its peak and then kind of decline from that point, you know, back to the normal levels. So this occurs you know, regardless of the scenario of the successful suppression or the large second wave or the massive second wave, um, it's just a matter of do we see that decrease multiple times and then, you know, jump back to those normal levels. So, you know, the anticipation is not that all elective procedures will come back, um, you know, at least not immediately. You know, it could be over a couple of year span. It just depends on you know, those individuals and their behavior and their response to, to COVID, which is, you know, difficult to predict because you're talking about people's, you know, mental states and, and what they're comfortable with. So one thing to note, though, on this slide is that uh, it doesn't in, uh, take into account the impact of a of, of vaccine. Uh, that's also something that's uh, difficult to predict. There's a lot of variables, you know, the efficacy of the vaccine, uh, how long it takes to get out to everybody, how many people want to take it. You know, some people won't take that vaccine. So um, lots of variables in that sense, and that's why that's not included in this, uh, this data set here. So, and all that being said, you know, prior authorization with no surgery does impact the renewal. 
just in the fact that we aren't going to account for those claims coming back in full, um, just be, we can't. Um, however, we, we know that those claims will come back into the picture and we don't wanna set your, your aggregate factors too low to a point that your employer health plans are you know, underfunded, right? Um, but you know, that's also important to note that you know, aggregate factors, they're not premium that's paid to a stop loss carrier at least. Um, those are just factors that we provide for you as an employer to set your funding. And uh, so anything that's below what we're telling you for your funding factors is, is savings on a self-insured plan versus you know, profit for the insurer on a fully insured plan. Uh, so that's important to keep in mind. You know, we're, not, we're not decreasing your aggregate rates because of the, the decrease in claims uh, drastically by any means. Uh, you know, the solution is that the, we're not going to weight the current year claims at the rate that we normally would. Um, so when we look at a three-year snapshot, the typical blend that we, we use when looking at your claims would be 70% weighting on the current year, 20% on the prior year, and 10% on that third period. Um, so we're going to shift that um, just because we know claims will come back. So we don't want to over account for a large dip in claims in this year. But at the same time, we're not, we're not changing those weightings drastically. Um, it's probably going to look more like a, you know, a 60-30-10 or a 65-25-10. Just kind of depends on how things bounce back as we get close to your renewal. So if we see the a large uptick in claims again, that's when the weighting is going to be a little bit lower because you know we're seeing four or five months of, of really low dollar claims, but and then all of a sudden we're seeing that uptick come back. So it really does play a role how the end of this year you know, turns out for all of you that have January 1 renewals. Um, with regards to, to large dollar specific claims, uh, we, we basically have to look at those as normal for the most part, because the whole idea behind uh, spec coverage is ensuring unknown risk, right? So if we know that there's some prior authorizations for a transplant, like we know that that's going to happen. So we're, we're gonna be taking that into account. Um, and we know that those claims are going to come back. So where, where you're going to see a positive on that front, though, in the interim, is that um, you know with the, the higher dollar elective procedures that haven't been happening, that's going to result in a lower loss ratio, loss ratio on your current year claims. Um, and then that has a positive impact on your spec premium moving forward. Um, really, the, the thing that's going to have the most uh, drastic or negative impact for your, for your employer groups is um, if you've seen a big dip in enrollment. And I'm not referring to furloughs because obviously those people are still on, on the plan. I'm referring to, you know, if you've had to do some, some massive layoffs. And uh, you know, we're gonna be looking at the census and the claims data that we have on hand and say, for example, you've you've laid off some people that were your better risk individuals, you know, lower age, didn't have any sort of ongoing prescription claims or, or things of that nature. And you're left with the higher risk population, but less premium on the plan to cover those high dollar claims. That's when you're going to see the more uh, negative impact on your renewal. Um, but other than that, you know, outside you know, with regards to COVID claims, obviously not, not a huge concern. Um, and then, you know, we're, we're accounting for the dip a little bit and giving you all the benefit of the doubt that, uh, you know, claims won't all come back at once and it'll kind of be spread out over the, the next couple of years. So I, I know it sounds not what you would expect, but it, it's almost essentially business as, as usual for us from uh, you know, a renewal perspective. Yeah, that's great to share. So um, here, here's a question that came through, David. And, and if you guys do have questions, you know, feel free to use that chat log and, and send those over. Um, so what this is looking like, and I'm just gonna leave this on this grid versus flip to that next slide. It doesn't, you know, went from the quarantine sheltering phase 
to a phase one, phase two, whatever, you know, state you're in. Um, and it's, you know, and it sounds like once that first initial phase and people are out and about, you know, this kind of flow, you know, it doesn't matter if you're phase four or through two. I mean, it's probably going to be pretty consistent in that. Would, would, would that be like? A, yeah, I mean, I think if you looked at, at Mark's slide, right, and I think he made reference to July or somewhere in there was one of their best or most active months that they've seen on plan, right? So they had the dip, which you're seeing in, in this slide, and then once you get back to social distancing being removed, you're going to see that influx above the 100% the mark, and then it'll kind of slowly level off. Um, and then obviously if there's some other, you know, uh, outbreaks or whatever, um, then we'll see that dip again. And then you'll see the same process happen again with an influx of uh, elective procedures and things of that nature happening. Uh, one thing that I, you know, I didn't mention, and it was actually, you know, part of my question to, to Mark, you know, that's something that we have to account for too, right, is that uh, some people are going to be putting off these procedures and or, you know, preventive visits or things of that nature. And then that's going to result in, you know, higher claims down the road or, you know, cancer, for example, if they're not catching it early on, you know, in a stage one or, or two, and all of a sudden it's caught at a stage three or four, that's going to result in some to, you know, significantly higher claims. Um, Obviously, the best way to, to curb cancer claims is to catch it early on. Um, otherwise, you know, it, it, we all know that story. Yeah, and I, um, even, even if a vaccine, or not if, when a vaccine happens, and hopefully this doesn't create more depression in people's world, but had, I heard a comment the other day was that um, you know, there, there hasn't been a, a ton of success with just removing viruses altogether. So a perfect example is the flu. It's seasonal, right? And so the real question is, once this vaccine happens, then then what? Like how much does it actually drop infection rates, which it will have an impact, but otherwise you don't need the vaccine or you need to keep working on it. But you know, does it keep doing this kind of thing on the seasons? Like what, what's our pattern gonna have to be to try to control? Because it most likely is gonna mean that there is social distancing and potential masking too if this COVID strain continues at the level it is, or even mutates, hopefully never worse, but it, it has potential to go either way. Um, it's been around a long time. This is not the, you know, the first time that, that COVID, that's why there's the 19, you know, not the first time it's ever been around. It's just that it's mutated to what it is. And so what's its seasonality going to look like? And what does it mean as a population that we have to manage it, you know, with the impact of the vaccines and, and you know, kind of this little blip could be, you know, an ongoing, yeah. yeah, I mean, there's there's potential for that that it's uh, it ends up being more of an annual trend where we're we're seeing this dip and then an influx. I mean, that's yeah. that's hard to say, right? right. I mean, yeah, uh, yeah. You know, this is kind of un unprecedented times where there's not a lot of data to to draw from to know. But you yeah. know, personal opinion seems like COVID something that uh, it's going to be around and we're going to have to live with for a while. Um, you know, obviously vaccines are, are in the works, but uh, it'll be interesting to see what the efficacy is of, of those vaccines and, and what, that, what that means. Um, just to kind of give you an idea in that slide that I gave you, uh, you know, when we're talking about the second wave, that, that red line, that's, that's only 10% infection. Mm -hmm. And then the, the massive, um, you know, second wave would be 20%. Mm -hmm. um, so those are still low numbers, right? Uh, in terms of, of the, the spread. Yeah. So, um, you know, vaccine will obviously, obviously help, but, uh, it seems like COVID something that we're going to have to deal with and, and work around for uh, a decent amount of time at least. Yeah. Mark, what do you think? I mean, I, I'm obviously not a doctor or anything, so I'm just, I mean, I'm kind of just thinking from a logic standpoint, if that makes sense, does that make sense to you too, as far as like the seasonality thing or, Oh yeah, I think I think you know we'll learn a lot through this flu season. Like I mentioned, um, testing is going to be key, um, and gearing up for you know to have enough testing is is uh, uh, top of mind for all of us in healthcare right now. When we um, when there was a big uptick in 
in Florida and Texas uh, two weeks ago, we, we didn't get reagent. Um, we didn't get testing kits. It all got diverted. Um, so we had, to, we had to change our criteria as to who gets tested. But, you know, the way that we're going to live with COVID is um, test, isolate, and contact trace. Uh, that's just going to be the game plan for a while, I think. Yeah. We can't stop the economy. I mean, it, it, it you know, I don't want to get yeah. political, but, yeah. um, you know, people, people need to participate in, um, in life. And um, so, you know, we're just going to have to be super vigilant and, and jump on things as they happen. Yeah. That's great. And, I, and guys, I really appreciate the time and everyone else for participating in this. The, the polls were, you know, I think gave us some good indicators of, of how people are feeling out there as well. Um, I don't know, uh, David or Mark, if you had any closing statements you wanted to end with, but um, feel free. Uh, maybe we'll start with David and finish with Mark, or you can say thank you and that whatever. I didn't really prep yeah. you. Um, no, I mean, I didn't really have any major closing statements. Um, you know, obviously it's just something that we're paying attention to and we're you know, trying to derive a strategy with every little bit of data that we get. Um, so you know, if, it, if anybody has any questions and they want to talk more in depth about any of this stuff, uh, feel free to reach out to me personally and uh, happy to have a conversation with you. And as we get more updates, happy to do that as well. But uh, first and foremost, just, you know, stay safe out there, everybody, and, and do what you can. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I'd echo that. I think, you know, Tyson's got our emails. If we can be of help with anything, uh, you know, our, our company is a self-insured uh, employer of 1,600 people too. And, and uh, we're, we're nervous about what's happening. But I think, you know, if we all work together to, to really um, move the healthcare system to that more population health-based approach, um, that's going to benefit us in a COVID era versus a, you know, whatever's going on. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, earlier is better. Um, outpatient is, is going to be less expensive than inpatient. And, um, you know, that's the way to, to attack costs and, and still provide hot, very high quality for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see how telehealth part of that is too, um, as well. So, yep. Yep. Yeah. Again, thank you, everybody. Thank you, David and um, and Mark for for putting in all this great information and, and taking the time to let us know what the thoughts there are that you guys have to be able to share. And then again, everyone for uh, for joining the meeting today. We're gonna share the slides, um, the recording to the to this as well. So in case there were some things you want to go back and listen to, um, feel free to reach out if you have any additional questions or want to uh, touch base with David or Mark as well. I'm happy to share contact information. Um, they said I couldn't put their cell phone numbers out, but maybe later. Right. <laughs> Mine's on the web somewhere. Yeah, yeah mine's right. out there too. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Yeah. Have a great Thanks day. for the time. Uh -huh. Thank you.